Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, I am Morgan Ortegas, the spokesperson uh, for the U.S. State Department, and I'm honored to be joined on stage by uh, my United States government colleagues and four very brave doctors. Dr. Tatiana Carballo, Dr. Ramo, Ramona Mateos, where are they? Where are the doctors? I oh, got it. Behind me. Oh, good. Hello. So you can wave to everyone. Okay, Dr. Rusella uh, Sabria. Right here. Okay. And Dr. Fidel Cruz. Great. These four doctors have risked everything to escape a life they did not choose. This morning, we will hear their personal accounts of harrowing stories about how the Cuban government exploited them by sending them abroad for work and medical missions programs. I am also joined by a distinguished group of U.S. government officials who are working to bring these abuses to the public's attention. With me today on stage is Carrie F uh, Filippetti, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Western Hemisphere Affairs. John Barsa, Admi Assistant Administrator for USAID's Bureau for Latin America and the Caribbean. Great. Ambassador Carlos Trujillo, U.S. Permanent Representative to the Organization of American States. And John C. Richmond, U.S. Ambassador at Large to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons. In the audience, we have Robert Destro, Assistant uh, Secretary for the State Department, Bureau of Democracy, Rights, and Labor, right here. And my longtime friend, Roger Carsons, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, for the Bureau of Democracy, Rights, and Labor. Uh, unfortunately, unable to join us today, but watching from U.S. Embassy Havana are Cuban independent journalists, many of whom the Castro regime forbids from traveling outside of Cuba. We welcome you. Today, the officials with me on the dais will call for action to stop the abuses that exist in Cuba's medical missions programs. Das Filippetti has been following this story closely and initiated today's briefing. We'll start with her. Good morning. Thank you so much for everyone's attendance today, um, and thank you to the Foreign Press Center and USAID for helping to organize this event. Um, I, I also want to thank my colleagues both on stage and in the audience from the State Department and USAID. I think the high-level participation in this briefing is a reflection of how seriously the United States takes the accusations um, against the Cuban regime. You know, I, I really don't want to say too much up front because the whole purpose of this briefing um, is to hear from our doctors, um, Dr. Matos and Dr. Carballo. Their government, the Cuban regime, um, has really denied them a voice for years. Um, during their abuse, they had their voices, their families, their money, their freedoms, and in some cases, their lives stolen from them. Here at the United Nations, our purpose is to come together as an international community to draw attention to abuses and to help make the world a more equitable place for countries and our communities, and to seek justice for those who have been wronged. We've all read the numerous accounts in the media about the uh, allegations on the Cuban regime's use of human trafficking under the cover of the doctor's program. But a few months ago, I had the opportunity to meet with these two doctors, to hear their stories up front, and their brave testimonies and those of hundreds of others that we have spoken to paint a picture of a program that is not intended to provide support to countries in need, but rather as a manipula manipulative corruption scheme intended to boost revenue for the Cuban regime, all under the guise of humanitarian assistance. We have heard repeatedly that the Cuban government collected revenue for each professional services and paid the worker a mere fraction of the revenue, almost all of which was deposited in a bank account in Cuba, to which they, were, they only had access upon completion of their mission and return to Cuba. We have heard how the government collected $7.2 billion in a single year from the export of professional services through programs like the Foreign Medical Missions. And while, those service, and while those services were ongoing, refused to provide even a living wage to those who are participating in it. We have heard accusations that doctors are coerced into the labor program and deprived of their rights and pay while separated from their families in Cuba. They are given no rights to travel. They are forced under Cuban surveillance. And they see retaliatory measures taken against their families should they choose to speak out. 
The United States Trafficking Victims Protection Act defines labor trafficking as the, quote, recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjugation to involuntarily servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. What you will hear from Dr. Ramona Matos and Dr. Tatiana Carballo will not only alarm you, but will raise serious concerns about Cuba's role in human trafficking. We hope it will inspire countries who have participated in the Cuban Doctors Program to condition any future participation on direct payments to the doctors and other fair labor practices. It is clear that anyone who hears these stories and continues to engage with the Cuban Doctors Program without insisting on fair labor practices is complicit in these crimes. I want to thank Dr. Ramona Matos and Dr. Tatiana Carbello for being brave enough to step forward today and share their story. There are many others who are not able to speak for fear of retribution, either against them or their families, and you'll hear some stories of that retribution from the doctors here today. What they have endured in their time in the medical missions program should not happen to anyone, and we sincerely hope that in sharing their stories today, it will help prevent others from suffering these atrocities in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Das Filippetti, and thank you for organizing this today. Now we're going to hear from Dr. Tatiana Caballo, who worked in Cuba's medical missions program in Venezuela for seven years and in Brazil. She left the program in Brazil, putting herself and her family at risk. Dr. Caballo, would you please step to the lectern and share your story about being recruited into the Brazil program, and then please describe your time in Venezuela. Buenas tardes. Eh, muchas gracias a, al Departamento de Estado de los Estados Unidos. Good afternoon, la, everyone. Thank you so much for the U.S. State Department. Y a la Fundación eh, para los Derechos Humanos en Cuba por su apoyo y por permitirnos eh, contar nuestras historias y denunciar al régimen castrista. And for the Foundation for Human Rights in Cuba and allowing us the opportunity to tell our stories and uh, let you know about the uh, Castro regime. Eh, yo me gradué como médico en el año 1994 en la Facultad de Medicina de Matanzas. I graduated as a doctor in 1994 in the medical uh, medicine faculty at Matanzas. Eh, el, el, en Cuba se, el gobierno dice mucho que bueno el, la educación en Cuba es gratuita y por tanto somos su propiedad. So as the Cuban government claim uh, education is free, free of charge, therefore we are their property. Eh, por lo tanto, desde, desde que nos graduamos, eh, percibimos un salario bien, bien bajo, y, de, y entonces come, comenzó, comienza la historia de las misiones eh, médicas en el exterior. So since we graduate, we get a minimal, a minimum salary, and that's where the story with the missions, with the medical missions, that's where, where that starts. Eh, primeramente nos enviaron a un país que se llama Belice, en es Sudamérica, Centroamérica. Estuvimos 11 meses en Belice con un previo, un, una previa firma de contrato, que supuestamente era un contrato, pero que no, no fue tal contrato. First, we were sent to a country, to Belize, for 11 months, uh, supposedly under a contract, which was no contract at all. Exactamente, y que fue, fue eh, voluntario y humanitario. They claim for this to be voluntary and for humanitarian purposes. Y en ninguna de las ocasiones, eh, repito, Misión Belice, Misión Venezuela, Misión Brasil, no fue ni voluntario ni humanitario. And in none of the missions, whether it was Venezuela, Brazil, or Belize, this was not voluntary at all. En, en el caso de Misión Venezuela, eh, desde que llegamos, desde que firmamos el contrato, todo fue bajo un régimen militar donde se nos prohibía La salida, las, las relaciones con, lo, con los venezolanos. So, in the Venezuela mission, it was under military supervision where we were restricted of, uh, we were deprived from our freedoms, we were deprived from engaging with local people from Venezuela. Nos pagaban una, una 
una, un 10%, 15% de, de, lo que, de lo que pagaba Venezuela, gobierno de Venezuela, Cuba, y el resto se quedaba en una cuenta congelada en, en Cuba. So we only got about 10 to 15% of the money that the Venezuelan government was paying for our services. The rest of the money was being sent to an account in Cuba. Exactamente, muchos de nosotros eh, eh, decidió no volver a Cuba, ese dinero no se le dio a la familia, ese dinero que ya ese médico trabajó, se, el gobierno cubano se lo confiscó, lo congeló. Many of us decided not to return to Cuba. This money didn't go to our families. This money was seized and was uh, frozen in accounts by the Cuban government. En Venezuela eh, la misión era bien difícil y encima de que era muy difícil con la presión que los que los coordinadores de la misión que no eran más que agentes de la seguridad. So in Venezuela we were under very very uh, difficult circumstance, circumstances. Um, we got pressure from the coordinators, quote unquote, who were nothing but agents of the government. Esos agentes de la seguridad nos tenían prácticamente bajo un bajo una bajo un asedio y un estrés constante y, y bueno había que hacer muchas cosas dentro de las cuales lo que más molestó y lo que más todavía me molesta fue fue falsificar las estadísticas. So these uh, security agents had us under constant pressure and what bothered me the most is that we had to falsify statistics. Y además algo bien serio que era eh, influir en, la, en, la, en el modo político de pensar de la población, o sea, obligarlos a la población de una manera coerciva a, a votar por Chávez o por Maduro. And also we had to influence the general population uh, to vote for the regime, either for uh, Maduro or Chávez. Exactamente. Ya después de, de Misión Venezuela, que todos pasamos por ahí, muchos de nosotros, yo estuve siete años en Venezuela, nos dicen que, que necesitaban, necesitaban en Misión Brasil, necesitaban médicos para, pero que ya, ya estuvieran en eh, Misión Anterior en Venezuela, que era como la escuela de las misiones. So, after the mission in Venezuela, I myself and many of us went there. Um, I was there for seven years. Once this mission was over, uh, the mission, uh, Brazil mission was offered to us, and this was for people who had already uh, undergone or went through the Venezuela mission, which was like the starting point for the missions. En Misión Venezuela fue PDVSA la que supuestamente pagaba la misión. So, uh, Petrolera, uh, la petrolera de, de Venezuela, PDVSA. PDVSA, which is the petrol company, the oil company from Venezuela, they were the ones who were disbursing the money and making payments for the mission. En el caso de Brasil era muy diferente. El caso de Brasil fue intermediado por la o OPAS, u Organización Panamericana de la Salud. So Venezuela, uh, Brazil was actually very different because this was actually being sponsored by a PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization. En ese caso, si no eh, mediaba esta organización, no podía Cuba hacer contratos con el gobierno de, de Brasil y bueno, eh, por ese motivo que eh, nos pagaban, el, el salario era supuestamente el, el 75% para Cuba, 5% de salario nuestro para Brasil y lo que se estaba hasta llegar a 100%, así al 100% era lo que nos pagaban a, a nosotros. So, we had to use the uh, PAHO as intermediaries in order to be uh, or participate in these missions. In Brazil, 75% of our earnings were going to the Cuban go government and 5% was going to Brazil. We only obtained the remaining to make us whole or, or make the 100% of our, of our fees. Entonces, bueno, eh, en ese, en ese, en, 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 cuando vimos aquello, nosotros nos quedamos, no sabíamos ni, ni qué iba a pasar porque el dinero que nos daba Cuba Inicialmente, cuando Ramona va, va a contar a hacer, a hacer su testimonio, y le daban un dinero a Ramona en Brasil y el otro dinero se lo depositaban en una cuenta congelada en Cuba. So, uh, the money that was going to Cuba, and Ramona will talk about this, uh, money that we were paying for our services in Brazil was being sent to Cuba and was being deposited into an account that was frozen by, by the government. Ya en mi caso, en nuestro caso no, en nuestro caso nos pagaban los 1200 reales 
eh, con independencia de el, dólares, con independencia del valor que tuviera el, el dólar en ese minuto. O sea, los reales eran 1.200 con independencia del, del, del valor del dólar. So, in my case, we got paid 1,200 reales or local currency regardless of the U.S. exchange rate. That's all we got. Y bueno, los gastos de instalación para lo que es conceptos de, de renta, comida, ropa, nuestros insumos, eh, lo pagaba la, la, el gobierno local de, de, cada, de cada municipio en, en Brasil. So in Brazil, each local government would pay for things such as food, clothing, and other necessities. Eh, en, en, en Brasil tuvo características especiales. Brasil permitió la, la familia, o sea, esposo, esposa, y hijos, e hijos menores de e hijos. So, in Brazil, they have special conditions where they actually allowed husband and wife and their children, their family unit. Exactamente. En mi caso, tengo la experiencia que mi hijo fue por tres años, porque era menor de edad, le dieron una visa dependiente. So, in my case, I had my son went there for three years. Uh, he was a minor, so he, his visa was derived from mine. Pero el gobierno de Cuba, el primer año que mi, mi hijo estuvo en Cuba, en 2016, cuando regresé de vacaciones, me obligó a firmar una hoja que ellos decían contrato. So, uh, when I went back to Cuba in 2016, I was forced by the government to sign a piece of paper, which they called a contract. Que decía que mi hijo tenía que volver para Cuba cada tres meses por disposición del de gobierno cubano. No puede estar en, en Brasil tres años. Stating that according to the Cuban conditions, my son had to return to Cuba every three months. He was not allowed to stay outside the country for three years. Lo cual era imposible porque el pasaje de, de Brasil Cuba es muy caro y todo eso era eh, costeado por nosotros. And that was impossible because the, the airfare from Cuba to Brazil is super expensive and we had to pay out of pocket. Entonces yo decidí pues dejarlo en Brasil con perfil bajo, prácticamente escondido en casa con el asedio de, de, la, de los agentes de la seguridad del Estado que se llamaban coordinadores. So I decided to leave him in Brazil, basically hiding at home under the pressure of the so-called coordinators me cansé de la esclavitud, me cansé de, de estar asediada, me cansé de que me controlaran, me cansé de que me quitaran el pasaporte. I was tired of being subjected to all the abuse, feeling like a slave. They withheld my, pas my passport. Uh, I got tired of all, all, all the pressure that they were putting on us. Me cansé de mentir y bueno, decidí felizmente eh, acogerme al Cuban Medical Parole y por eso estoy en este minuto, gracias a ustedes, contándole contándole mi, mi historia lo más escueto posible. I was exhausted and tired of lying, so I decided to join the Cuban uh, parole visas, and that's why I'm here telling you my story. Entonces ya tienen. Muchas that, gracias. That's it. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, doctor. Wonderful. Dr. Ramona Matos worked in Cuba's medical missions programs in Bolivia and in Brazil. Dr. Matos, will you please share your story about your pay and restrictions, then you can tell us about your escape and what happened to your family. Buenos días. Good morning. Mi nombre es Ramona Matos Rodríguez. Eh, Yo soy médico especialista en medicina general integral. I am Ramona Matos Rodriguez. I specialize in family medicine. Eh, yo hice dos, dos misiones, una que fue en Bolivia en el 2008. I went to two missions, one to Bolivia in 2008. Y la otra con, eh, fue en el 2013 en Brasil. And the second one was in 2013 uh, in Brazil. Escuetamente voy a contarles, hay, hay mucho que, que contar, son muchas historias, pero escuetamente quiero hacerle partícipe de mis experiencias y de cómo nos traficaban eh, a, lo, a los médicos cubanos y cómo fuimos víctimas del de gobierno cubano. There is a lot, to be, a lot to be told. I will briefly explain and tell you some of my own experience as to what we went through how we were basically being trafficked 
and how we were victims and exploited by the Cuban government. En el 2008 fui a Bolivia y me asignaron el de, en el departamento de es un es el Amazona eh, de Bolivia en una en un pueblo llamado San Agustín. So in 2008 um, I went to Bolivia in a small town in the Amazon called San Agustín. Cuando fuimos para Bolivia eh, nos entregaron un pasaporte rojo que era un pasaporte oficial. When we went to Bolivia, we were handed a red passport, which is an official passport. Con él viajamos en el avión durante esas nueve horas que estuvimos allá. So we were with this passport with us, stayed with us for the nine hours of the flight. Y cuando est estábamos haciendo eh, inmigración en el aeropuerto de Bolivia, había una oficial de seguridad del estado. Eh, afuera quitándonos el pasaporte rojo. So as we were doing immigration to get into Bolivia at the airport, there was a state agent, a security agent from Cuba who was taking away our passports. Nosotros estuvimos trabajando en Bolivia indocumentado. Nosotros no teníamos ningún documento que dijera nuestro nombre, no teníamos pasaporte, no teníamos identificación. So we basically worked uh, without any identification. We were undocumented. We had no documents bearing our names. We had no passport, no ID whatsoever. Por lo que si nos pasaba algo, si alguien nos, nos llevaba de ahí, si nos moríamos, si pasaba algo, nadie conocía quién era esa gente que había muerto o que se había desaparecido o que le había pasado algo. So ha anything happened to us, suppose we get hurt, we die, nobody would know who that person who died or got hurt or anything. No one would know our, our identity. Nunca nos explicaron las condiciones que tenía Bolivia por ser un país del altiplano. They never explained to us uh, the geographic con uh, conditions that we had to endure in Bolivia. Por lo que me vi expuesta a las condiciones atmosféricas del altiplano y conocí de muchos médicos que a cinco o a seis días de llegar al altiplano murieron por complicaciones cardiovasculares. So it was never explained to us the issues with the altitude. A few doctors or some of the doctors five or six, six days into arrival got very, very ill. Some of them died due to cardiac complications. En el pueblito del Amazonas, eh, lo, lo primero que me chocó fue que diariamente tenía que escribir en una hoja nombres falsos, edades falsas, direcciones falsas de pacientes que no veía. What bothered me the most in that small town in, in the Amazons was that every day I had, I had to write in a piece of paper fake names, fake ages, and addresses of people. Era una estadística. That was just statistics. Porque eso era lo que nos obligaban los agentes que eran quienes no, no, nos seguían, quienes nos controlaban. Era lo que teníamos que poner. Si no lo poníamos, teníamos que irnos para Cuba sin nuestro salario. Eh, allí lo perdíamos ese, eh, el dinero que se nos guardaba en el, en el banco, claro, y comisión. Rota, eso significaba que tú no ibas a ser nadie más en, en Cuba. Así mismo no lo decían. So, our handlers, these coordinators, we were forced and required to collect all this fake information, and otherwise we would be sent back to Cuba without any of our earnings or salaries. Uh, what they call a, a broken mission. If we went through, if we broke the mission, that meant that we would lose all our earnings. Allí tam también vi cómo eh, los medicamentos que se coordinaban para la atención de esos pacientes, al no existir pacientes, al no ver pacientes físicamente, eh, los medicamentos tenían que jugar con la cantidad de pacientes que veía. So Allí, there was also. Ay, perdón. Siga usted. Also, medication-wise, uh, we had to see all these patients that did not exist. 
So we had to correlate the medication for the care of the patients for patients that did not exist. Y entonces teníamos que destruirlo. So we had to destroy the medications. Pasé a Brasil en el 2013, al Amazonas. In 2013, I went to Brazil in the Amazon's area. En el Mais Medico. Nelly? En el Mais Medicos. At the, ma Mais Medicos. At the, the, the company called Mais Medicos. Y allí eh, me di cuenta que era una mentira. That's where I realized that this was all a lie. Nos daban 400 dólares y nos ponían 600 dólares en un banco en Cuba. We were getting $400 and $600 were being deposited into a bank account in Cuba, which monies that were actually frozen, que lo hasta que tú y tu until you finish, successfully finish and completed por your eso, mission. Por eso, eh, fui hasta el de los That's where I went to the Congress in, in Brazil. Y denuncié el trabajo esclavo de los médicos cubanos. And I, I uh, denounced the slaver-like work performed by uh, Cuban doctors. Ellos, ellos me ayudaron mucho y tuve que pedir asilo político en Brasil y asilo aquí por el por el parole para médico cubano. They helped me a great deal. I had to request asylum in Brazil and also here in the United States through the parole for medical uh, practitioners. Y al llegar aquí, bueno, con ayuda de la Fundación para los Derechos Humanos, eh, nosotros hicimos una denuncia eh, de toda esta esclavitud de los médicos cubanos, de todas las misiones, y so, por eso estamos aquí. When we got here, aided by the Foundation for Human Rights, we were able to uh, establish and set up a legal claim and that's why we are here today. Yeah. That's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Matos, for sharing your story. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite Assistant Administrator John Barsa to the lectern. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, the disturbing accounts that we've heard from Dr. Carballo and Dr. Matos is really just the tip of the iceberg. Like uh, Das Filippetti, I've had the opportunity to sit down with both of them and engage in conversation. And what you hear about the details about the entire process, what they've gone through, it's, it's truly horrifying. They study medicine to be doctors, to be healers, to dedicating their time and talent to others. And from what we've heard of today, the Cuban regime is exploiting them, making them sell their services. Uh, this business of forced labor is the functional equivalent of modern-day sla uh, slavery. It constitutes the regime's largest source of revenue. And it's a primary means of spreading their influence and in propaganda internationally, as we've heard as well. So you have to realize, while these skilled doctors are sent to work in other countries, allegedly for pennies on the dollar, Cubans on the island themselves struggle to find adequate health care and other basic services. The people of Cuba are deprived of essential health care while the regime exports the island's human resources, medications, and medical supplies in the name of profit. And all the while, the regime touting the false narrative that it treats its citizens with the best medical care in the world. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. So what we are calling on is independent journalists, social media, bloggers, inside Cuba and outside Cuba, to try to bring light to this horrible practice that's taking place right now in this modern day age. Expose this gross violation of human rights. Let the world know about what these crimes. So as Dr. Matos did, what she was able to do in Brazil, she was able to go to um, entities within Brazil to bring light of this. It's certainly difficult for independent journalists and NGOs to operate within Cuba. What we have right now is with this practice of uh, human, human trafficking, it's taking place in foreign countries where NGOs, human rights activists, journalists have more access and more ability to expose this. So we are calling on, again, journalists, activists, civil society organizations to bring light to this in these countries wherever it takes place. Um, we also encourage civil society groups to combat the forced labor and trafficking pers in persons by supporting and advocating for the victims themselves. 
We ask you to raise awareness through your networks in the international community. Let the world know about these crimes, about the human rights victims, the doctors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Assistant Administrator Barsa. Ambassador Trujillo, we welcome your remarks. Thank you and good morning. It's an honor to be here and I would like to congratulate the courageous doctors who have taken the time to be here. Listening to their story definitely inspires all of us. I think it's important today to draw attention for not only here in the United States but also for the and the organizations and country in which you represent. And I think our call today is very, very clear. I had prepared remarks to go into the depths of this program, but what we're really asking here is for a lot of the countries, the majority of whom are democracies and share the same values, respect human rights, who are continuing to traffic and conduct these type of activities with Cuban doctors in their countries to please stop. Our message is very powerful. Across the Americas, there are multiple countries that continue to have these programs. Brazil has renounced that program. President Bolsonaro mentioned it in his speech. Other countries have that same obligation. The stories that you've heard today should not continue to take place. It should have never happened, and it's a tragedy that right now, as we stand here with these four doctors, there are thousands of others who are in the same position across the world. So to our friends and to the countries who celebrate democracy, to the countries who honor human rights, to those civil society groups that defend them, you have a duty to stop this awful behavior. Thank you. That was very moving. Thank you, Ambassador. I would now like to invite Ambassador John Richmond to the lectern. The crime of human trafficking destroys human dignity. It is a crime that attacks the, the basic idea that everyone has inherent value. I am so grateful that the United States Congress created an office within the State Department to focus on human trafficking, and it's a great honor to get to serve as the United States ambassador for this issue of human trafficking, which at its heart is all about freedom. It's this idea that everyone should be free to make the most basic decisions about their lives, that they get to decide when they wake up in the morning, where they work, and who touches their bodies. I am deeply concerned, uh, and you'll see reflected in this year's uh, Trafficking in Persons report from the United States State Department, that Cuba has been downgraded to Tier 3, which is the lowest level of our ranking system regarding trafficking in persons. It was downgraded for its failure to meet minimum standards for the elimination of trafficking and for making no significant efforts to do so. Despite persistent allegations that Cuban officials had threatened and coerced some participants to remain in the medical program, the government took no actions to address forced labor in its medical foreign missions. In fact, the United States State Department has documented indicators of human trafficking in Cuba's overseas medical missions each year since 2010, including in this year's Trafficking in Persons Report. Forced labor, which is also referred as labor trafficking, uh, encompasses a whole range of activities from recruiting, harboring, transporting, and providing individuals, whether it's through force, threats of force, psychological coercion, abuse of legal process, deception, holding people's identity documents, threats to their family members or third parties, traffickers, whether they're traffickers as individuals, traffickers as organized gangs, or traffickers as state-sanctioned forced labor, that traffickers are using nonviolent coercion to compel people to engage in work or to compel people to engage in commercial sex acts. And this must stop. To date, the, the Cuban government has not made serious and sustained efforts, and we call on them to do so. We also look to governments around the world um, that they can, in host countries, 
investigate these crimes, gather information about indicators of trafficking and where cases of trafficking occur, that they can focus on those. The bottom line is that we want to keep freedom and human dignity at the center of our foreign policy. And we want to call on governments around the world to join us in that effort. I'm grateful for the courage of the physicians that spoke here today, grateful for their voice, their willingness to share their stories. Uh, it's an honor to, to be here with them today. Thank you. So we're now going to go into our Q&A uh, portion. We're going to be able to take a few questions, uh, but I'm going to take the liberty of actually asking the first question. So to Dr. Matos, when you were in Bolivia, how did you manage the medicines and the patient lists, and what instructions were you given about record keeping? Sí, cuando estuve en Bolivia, eh, los, los asesores que eran los, los jefes que no estaban allí en ese pueblo. So when I was in Bolivia, the advisors, the bosses, the handlers, who were not physically in that town, ellos a las seis de la tarde te exigían que tú dieras un parte. They demanded report at 6 p.m. En, en el reporte ese debías poner 30 pacientes vistos diario. In that report you had to write down that you had Como seen mínimo. As, as a minimum 30 patients a day. Eso me chocó cuando llegué allí, es decir que me, me dio shock. I, I was shocked by that when I got there. Porque el, el primer día que yo comencé a trabajar me di cuenta que allí no iba nadie. The first day that I went to work, I realized that no one was going there for health care. Le dije a la, a la otra muchacha, a la doctora que estaba allí, ¿y cómo tú haces para ver 30 pacientes? And I asked my fellow doctor who was there too, I Dice, asked her, how do you see 30 patients a day? Dice, bueno, ya tú te vas a enterar. She said, well, you'll figure it out. Ese día a las seis de la tarde llamé a, a mi jefe y le dije, yo no he visto pacientes. That day I called my boss at 6 p.m. I told him I haven't seen any patients. Me dijo, tienes que mandarme 30 nombres de 30 pacientes. You have to send me 30 tienes names que inventarlo. with 30 patients. Tienes you have to make them up. You have to make up diagnosis. Durante ese, ese mes que estuve allí hice eso. And that's what I did that one month that I was there. Porque si no lo hacía, me, me mandaban para, para Cuba con la misión revocada. If I didn't do that, I would, send, I would be sent back to Cuba with a revoked mission, and I'd be punished. Y sin el dinero que me ponían en, en la cuenta en Cuba. And no access to the money that was being deposited into the account in Cuba. Fui testigo en la farmacia de que los medicamentos Al, al sobrar porque no había paciente, tenías que botarlo, quemarlo, incinerarlo, enterrarlo, desaparecerlo. I, was, I, I witnessed at the pharmacy, since we had no patients, all the excess medication had to be disappeared. We burnt it or we, we got rid of it any way possible. Porque el gobierno cubano tenía que justificar que esos 30 pacientes que ellos sabían que eran falsos, que no habían sido vistos, tenían que justificarlo con medicamentos que estaban en la farmacia para ellos, que supuestamente se les tenía que dar gratis. Because the Cuban government, they had to justify the medication being used for those 30 fake patients. That medication was to be used for them, but they were no patients. Uh, these stories are just so incredibly brave. I've been really honored to be here today. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to journalist q and I have my very capable brand-new deputy, Kel Brown, who uh, just joined the State Department, who's going to take over uh, for me from here. Thanks, Kel. Thanks, Okay, so we have uh, time for a few questions. Ms. First hand up. Hi. I'm Mariela Navarro from Agence France Presse. 
Thank you very much for this opportunity. So I have one question for the doctors and another one for U.S. officials. My first question is, um, what happened when you defect the program, when you abandon? What are the consequences? And what happened to the money that was frozen? Or if you could explain us that. O sea, ¿qué pasa cuando uno abandona el programa? And for the U.S. official, I would like to know uh, if there is a program to help this professional to keep being doctors here in the U.S. and keep uh, their healing vocation. Thank you. Bueno, la primera pregunta fue... So the first question was, what happened with the money? ¿Cuál es la primera pregunta? No. ¿Qué pasa con el dinero y en general cuáles son las consecuencias de abandonar el programa? del gobierno en Cuba. Si el médico que no quería regresar era voluntaria la misión, pero si el médico no quería regresar voluntariamente, como supuestamente era la misión, ese dinero, el gobierno no se lo daba a la familia, el dinero que tú habías trabajado, que habían pagado por ti ese país, se quedaba en Cuba. Ya tú, tú no tenías derecho más a regresar a Cuba como no tienes derecho de regresar a Cuba. Todos nosotros estamos castigados por ocho años y, y, y fuimos médicos voluntarios. So uh, the monies were not given to our families. They stayed in Cuba, frozen. Uh, our earnings, part of that money, small amount, was given to us in the host country. The other money was going to Cuba. And for defecting or leaving the mission, we were penalized eight years, even though we were so-called volunteers. Con respecto a lo que usted preguntó sobre si hay algún programa para ayudarnos a reinsertarnos en el in, in, it's no. And your second question, if there's a program to help us uh, get, uh, be, to be able to practice medicine in this country, the answer is no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to add one, one yeah. point to that. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, the issue is a lot of the, um, when, when the doctors flee these programs, um, as was described, a lot of them have had their papers stolen from them and so on. So we've had, um, throughout uh, U.S. history, we've had a number of different programs to try to ensure that Cubans do have a place here in the United States. So we continue to have programs like the Cuban Adjustment Act um, and, uh, and, 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 and others to facilitate their, their travel here. Um, and so it is important to us that we are, we are assisting them when they come to the, to the United States. We don't have any specific programs programs um, in terms of, uh, you know, facilitating their continuation of being doctors here. Um, but obviously, they've, they have come to this country. Um, we're trying to make sure that we're drawing attention to the issue so that we can um, uh, stop this practice so that they can actually serve as doctors um, in, in the countries where they'd like to serve as doctors as opposed to being trafficked wherever the Cuban government tells them to go. Thank you. The second question over here. Carla Angola de, de, from EVTV Miami. Um, I want to know who of, of them were in Venezuela. Eh, ¿Quiénes de ustedes estuvieron en Venezuela haciendo ese programa en Venezuela? Si nos pueden contar exactamente lo que vivieron allí. If you can tell us what exactly you have to, to live there, experience there. And if uh, some ideology thing were part of the program uh, inside those locations. Eh, si alguna del, de los temas políticos o ideológicos las obligaban a decir eh, frases a favor del régimen, si de todo eso nos pueden hablar, que fue lo más difícil de haber vivido en Venezuela en ese programa. Buen día. Good morning. Eh, mi nombre es Fide Cruz, soy médico cubano, también estamos presentes en, en el tema de la demanda. I am Fidel Cruz. I am also a Cuban doctor who is part of this uh, lawsuit. 
estuve en, en Venezuela desde 2011 hasta 2014. I was in Venezuela from 2011 to 2014. Eh, en el tiempo que estuve allá fue las elecciones de Chávez y, y las elecciones de Maduro. While I was there, we went through the Chavez election and also Maduro's election. En, nos obligaban la, los representantes del gobierno en cada consulta que nosotros veíamos, en cada paciente que nosotros atendíamos, a hablarle del gobierno, a hablarle le, de las cosas buenas que tenía el gobierno de Maduro y influir en la mentalidad del, del pueblo para que votaran a favor de Maduro o de, o de Chávez. So, while I was there, uh, we were influenced and forced by the so-called representatives, the, our Cuban government or the agents, to talk to each patient that we saw about the benefits and not the positive things of the Maduro uh, regime and government and to influence their vote. En específicamente las elecciones de Maduro me tocó eh, salir a las calles a, a tocar en la puerta a los a las personas y incentivarlos a llevarlos al, a los colegios elector, electorales para que votaran a favor de Maduro. Especially and specifically for the Maduro elections, I was on the streets, knocking door to door, encouraging people to go to um, vote, to go to the electoral polls and vote for Maduro. Cada uno de nosotros, de, lo, de los médicos que estuvimos en Venezuela, eh, teníamos que dar un reporte a un, una estadística a nuestros jefes de la, lo, de la seguridad del Estado eh, sobre cuántos eh, pacientes llevamos a, a los colegios elector, electorales y si votaron o no por, por el oficialismo. We had to write a report for our bosses, our handlers, where we had to show statistics as to how many of those patients that we saw we were actually able to take to the polls and how many of them actually voted for uh, Maduro's regime. Creo que con eso que respondí a tu pregunta. I think that answers your question. Quería saber, ¿los obligaban a chantajear a los pacientes de alguna manera a cambio de medicina o de atención? Es decir, eh, te vamos a dar medicinas o te vamos a atender si votas por el régimen, por el gobierno de Maduro o de Chávez? Sí, eran cosas como, por ejemplo, te atendía y te decía, eh, recuerda que estás aquí hoy, que estoy aquí atendiéndote a ti, gracias a Maduro, gracias a Chávez, que si ellos no están en el poder, nosotros no vamos a estar aquí, no vas a tener salud, el sistema de salud va a decaer, eran cosas así. So the question was, uh, did you get any incentives? for your patients? Do you have to bribe them as to treatment for them or medications in exchange of their vote? Answer, yes, we had to incentivate them and remind them that it's thanks to uh, the government and the, the Maduro regime that you are getting healthcare services, healthcare medicine, and so on. Um, Ellen Wolforce with the Thompson Lawyers Foundation. Uh, Two-part question. One, could you elaborate a little bit, uh, I guess, uh, the doctors on what legal claims you're seeking from whom that, you know, that the lawsuit that I think Dr. Matos mentioned? Um, and then for U.S. officials, I'm just kind of curious, um, what countries are still sponsoring the Cuban medical missions and what steps have been taken to ask them to stop? We could start with the second part of that. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and obviously, with the amount of money that we're seeing come into the Cuban regime, um, it's clear that this program is continuing across the world. So, um, we're doing an in-depth analysis right now of exactly where it's taking place. But we assess that there's um, at least 66 countries around the world that are uh, utilizing this program. Um, I do think it's you know for some of those countries like Brazil, for example, uh, they have come forward um, to uh, insist on fair labor practices, and after insisting on that, uh, the Cuban regime decided to end the program. Uh, so rather than engage in providing support for the people of Brazil who needed it, 
um, they, they decided, well, since we can't traffic these, these doctors um, and benefit off of their labor, um, then we're not going to engage. So we're doing a, uh, a sort of uh, outreach campaign to all of our posts to try to identify where these doctors are operating exactly, uh, to understand the nature of those agreements. Um, and then we're putting on events like this as well as private engagements to make it clear um, to them exactly what is going on in these programs so that they can't say that they weren't aware that it was human and trafficking and we know that a lot of these countries do need medical support um, but uh, again that cannot be done through forced labor and so we're trying to find other ways that we can uh, help them in identifying other opportunities to uh, get medical care to their countries without using the the program that uses uh, slave labor I'm Sam Dubbin I'm the attorney for the four doctors in the federal lawsuit um, they asked a question about. Um, yeah. yeah, we could we could answer that question uh, shortly afterwards. All right. Next question. Buenos días, Carlos Alejandro Rodríguez para Cubanet. Eh, los periodistas independientes en Cuba eh, sabemos, o sea, hemos sufrido también la represión directamente, pero nuestros familiares también. Entonces me gustaría saber de parte de, lo, de los médicos si sus familias en Cuba también han sido víctimas cuando ellos han decidido eh, irse a otro país a, apl a aplicar un programa de parol. O sea, ¿Qué ha pasado con, con los familiares en Cuba? La pregunta es, como para los periodistas, cuando estamos en Cuba, en Cuba, uh, there's uh, our families, they suffer the consequences, threats, and so on. So is this the same case for the doctors who abandon the mission, and what happens to your families? Buenos días. Mi nombre es Rusela Rivero. También formo parte del grupo que estamos en esta demanda. Eh, para contestar esa pregunta, sí, eh, yo en lo particular eh, estoy siendo víctima de eso. Tengo dos hijos médicos, mi hijo mayor eh, hace cinco años que está graduado y a partir de que yo deserté, o sea que abandoné el programa en Brasil, a mi hijo mágicamente le quitaron el trabajo de médico de consulta. Mi hijo está haciendo una labor de operario, o sea, fumigando, no sé si saben lo que es, fumigando las casas, acompañando a un grupo de, de, de técnicos que son los que deben hacer ese trabajo y él es como uno más de ese, de ese grupo. No le han designado una consulta más, no lo, no lo han puesto más nunca a interactuar como médico. Cuando él, este, y yo misma que él me dijo eso, eh, pregunté, bueno, pero ¿qué pasó? ¿Qué explicación te dieron? Mami no me dan ninguna explicación. Solamente le dijeron, tú sabes de qué se trata, tú sabes por lo que es. Acógete al plan o pide la baja. No puede pedir la baja porque de qué va a mantener su familia y de qué va a vivir él. Entonces, él está ahí tranquilo, pero sin, siendo médico sin ser médico. Solamente por ser hijo de Rusela. So my name is Rusela Rivero. I also form part of this lawsuit. And I myself, I am a victim of this uh, prosecution or persecution. Uh, I have two children, they're both doctors. Uh, my oldest son, he graduated, he became a doctor five years ago. ago. And uh, he basically lost his job. Uh, he's working now as an exterminator. He goes with extermination technicians from all over the place doing exterminating work. He was, uh, he's not allowed to have consults or see patients. Um, and he asked me what happened, and I'm, I'm, myself, I'm in shock, and I asked. And the only answer that he gets is that you know why this is happening, and you have to comply with the plan. And uh, he, has, he, he can like withdraw himself from working, which he cannot because he needs to support himself. So it's a really uh, there and difficult uh, situation that he's going through just because he's my son. Y el segundo hijo se, se graduó ahora en agosto y también mágicamente a la hora de las ubicaciones le dijeron tienes que irte para la parte rural, eh, un municipio bien lejos de Santiago, Guamá. Y él dijo, pero ¿y por qué? 
Eh, bueno, porque no hay ubicaciones en Santiago, en el municipio, que es de donde somos nosotros, Santiago de Cuba. Y entonces, bueno, él fue para allá. Allá estaba trabajando en un consultorio en plena Sierra Maestra y muchos compañeros de él de su mismo curso están trabajando en, en policlínicos, en áreas de salud, en la ciudad. Entonces, él fue a ver por qué no, no lo habían ubicado donde él había pedido, que le había querido estar en la ciudad, y le dijeron que no, que eso era lo que le tocaba. Sencillamente, eso fue lo que te tocó. Y tienes que estar allí. So my second son, he graduated as a doctor in August of this year. When it came time for job placement, he was sent to a rural, faraway area on the outskirts, a city called Guaman, far, far away. We are from Santiago. We are from the city, Santiago of Cuba. He does work as a doctor. He works in a doctor's office. Uh, his uh, fellow students, people who graduated with him, they actually got placed in the city, in Cuba. When he asked why he couldn't get placement in the city, they told him, well, that's what you get. That's what you have to do. And uh, that's the end of it. Just, just take it. Es, es así. O uh, sea, es como trabajan. No te dan una explicación. Sencillamente, tienes que hacerlo. That's, that's the way they work. There's no explanations. You just have to do it. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. experimentaron y en términos de la salud mental y se considera que esta coerción contra sus hijos es una manera de silenciarla a usted en una forma de abuso psicológico por parte del régimen cubano. Bueno, eh, sin lugar a dudas, sin lugar a dudas es una manera. A veces me cuesta admitirlo, pero no por eso me van a callar. Question. Al contrario. Do you think Using your children, uh, bar bargaining chips, is the way of the regime to silence you. Answer, uh, absolutely, uh, they are using me, uh, my children, they're trying to silence me. It really breaks my heart, and it's hard for me to admit it, but there is no way that I am going to be silenced. Thank you so much uh, for your participation. Again, I wanna thank Dr. Uh, Carballo, Matos, Sarabia, and Cruz uh, for their unwavering courage and uh, personal sacrifice in raising global awareness about the exploitation perpetrated by Castro's regime. Your stories are truly remarkable. And thank you, guest, uh, for your participation. Uh, this concludes the event.